standing and talk, right? Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, I just went to this event in March. Uh, it's actually like three days conference. It's actually a two days conference, and uh, the last day is actually hackathon. So uh, it's in Tokyo. It's actually the first time it has a hackathon. Uh, so they are giving like a lot of luxury prizes like Nintendo Switch for the guys. And yeah, so um, I'm introducing myself. My name is Amy Chiang, and I'm a software engineer in Tiger Spike, which is just around Tanjung Paga. So yeah, so uh, this is my uh, contact. And um, so just a brief introduction about Tiger Spike. It's just uh, we are actually a digital product company that we have uh, user experience, uh, user experience services, and uh, app and web. Um, kind of company and yep so uh, this is like uh, emotion emotion journey mapping for me uh, throughout these three days so you can see mostly it's actually a happy kind of emotions and um, so uh, it's actually uh, it's a very fruitful experience for me and uh, the last day I'm, I'm sort of like brain dead because I've actually learned a lot of stuff so yeah and um, so actually before the two days conference there's uh they actually have a networking session so uh they actually break they actually like oh, anyone can join to um they have a event that um for you to walk to observatory tower for you to have a, like a networking session with all the developers so you can actually use this chance to uh talk to er everyone and like you, you will know like different developers they are working on quite a lot of interesting kind of stuff so um, this is the schedule mainly, and you can see there's actually different uh, different uh, talking duration. So if, if you can see, there's a lightning. It's usually it's around um, five to fifteen uh, minutes of presentation. So uh, and most and others around twenty to forty. Forty minutes is the longest presentation. So uh, that uh, mostly all of them actually talking about. Um, their sites projects and some uh, swift practices, and it and this year I noticed there's quite uh, that there, there are some machine learning, uh, VR, and some object detection in the presentation, which I find quite um, it's like a different kind of thing that we normally do in a mobile environment or web kind of swift stuff. So uh, yeah, conference. Highlights. That's a disclaimer. Uh, I won't. I'm not going to repeat the whole presentation, and I won't. Th I didn't. I won't be the best person to explain all of their awesome presentation. So I'm actually. Uh, I will only choose some presentation that I found it, uh, interesting. That I'm actually uh, interested to know more. That's why I do some research on it, and uh, and that's for some pre that's. After this, I will say I will actually show that uh, there's some presentation that I also find it interesting, but I doesn't have a chance to show it for today. So uh, after that, I will actually attach some Google's uh, some slides from them, uh, the presenter slide. So uh, it's actually good for you guys to look at it. It's actually uh, very in very detailed information. So uh, the first topic is cross platform. So. Um, Cross-platform, before this I thought cross-platform is more like a hybrid app which is, um, I don't really like to give, I don't, um, before this I have experience with all these um, PhoneGap, uh, PhoneGap and some other platform which don't really work well with native. So, uh, so I don't really have a pleasant experience with that. But uh, so right now for cross-platform uh, experience, uh, I will there are two interesting presentation. One is actually Swift on Android, which is I uh, uh, try to plot the Swift uh, into Android. And build your own tools is actually uh, about React Native. So um, Eric Wing is actually uh, he's not only uh, an Android developer and also a co he's actually a Cocoa developer who actually uh, he has his own SDK called Blur SDK with another R so um, he's, he's giving a lot of opinions on how he actually developed his um, SDK that uh, mask uh, that 
must over some difficulty in porting the Swift to Android environment. So and uh, Ota he is actually uh con made the he actually contributed a lot in Cocoa Pots for the previous five years. So he so he will actually talk about his experience on building React Native uh in React Native projects. So uh back to Swift on Android main questions like so do I right now do I can I write Android in Swift? So sadly it's actually still no. It's so um to to build uh Android in Swift we have to go through quite a lot of process on doing it and so in next slide it's so next slide is actually like uh, it's possible but it will be painfully inconvenient for you guys so uh uh so but the whole concept of uh swift to be on and to use swift on android is the fundamental stuff that if you got a live uh c makes everything possible so you have to uh kind of uh by um by developing swift on android you have to overcome some Linker's errors, which is I not sure you can find a lot of people can answer you on Google or Stack Overflow, and you have to develop a method that interface the JNI the Java uh, interface, and in this case you have you might need to resort to some hacks or code generation. So um, so in this case, so I'm explaining on C. So, so you can imagine like C is like a building block for everything. So if and Swift can actually talk to C. So um and so if you got a library that you want to use it in Android, as long as you actually mask it, you can actually um talk to it. So um and for the build system, libraries and language you will see that you like let's say UI kit is not really the like it's actually consider the UI it's not really like the language of the Swift so uh, mainly for Swift on Android we're actually using Swift core for that and build system we will see like for like Xcode build system Android Studio and Visual Studio which is actually a uh, way more um, different with each, each other so language the language will be the one that we use to standardize and to try to talk with each other but I mean because right now the platform vendors won't be actually they won't really have an interest to build the platform that we can to let the language to communicate with each other so um so yeah you can try to use swift package manager swift compiler like x xcode and like how xcode actually does and reproduce their commands and um from what eric mentioned in, in his presentation he actually mentioned like it's really quite pain and hard to scale as is um as you have to went through a lot of process to 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 do them so um so another another way is a c make which i try to um know more about it to see it's actually like a cross platform meta build system so um so similar like um you need to list the file that you want to build in a text file so um it c make will actually like create a native project for it like um like a Visual Studio and Xcode and make files. So in his blur SDK, he handled the build system and uh, challenge using the CMake inside his SDK and provide like kind of provide convenience of deployment ready pre built libraries for 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 us to use. So um so Eric actually uh, Eric Wing actually um produced he actually um released his beta version of uh, Blur SDK and he actually demo his uh, gaming uh, he demo his Flappy Bird in iOS and Android by using his SDK and yeah and for the so for the libraries in writing in Android so um, so you, you can see right now there's a native and you can we can actually you can split as three categories. So uh native Android only development or cross platform development like the non native GUI. But it's usually common to be used in uh video games. 
and if it's actually C library, you can again to you can, again you can use it in Swift and cross-platform uh, native GUI. So he actually suggested uh, IUP, which is portable user interface, that uh, to help you to develop Swift in, on Android more easily. So um, so move to React Native, which is uh, before this. Like I said, I I have. I heard about it. I know it's actually, um, it's actually a JavaScript. You write like JavaScript syntax, but I not. I don't really uh, have the idea of um, playing with it for mobile development. So after uh, hearing after Ota share his experience by moving away from Swift, and typically it's actually native code. So uh, he. He decided to move away because he found like the effort for uh for two hours engineer end up uh the effort of um fixing and developing end up to be the same for one web engineer. So their their team actually decided to give uh, React Native a shot. So um so he he go he explained quite a lot of um the development pattern and they end up choosing React Native at that stage because they find it's um this React Native is still a development it's still on their development phase so there's still quite a lot of improvement so to explain what is React Native React React like is actually a Facebook project that they actually offer a single direction component model which is you data can only flow flow down so um that can replace the whole and we. MVC stack in front of uh, in front end application, so um, so React Native is like the implementation of React where instead of having a abstract web page, so web page DOMs, it creates a native view hierarchy, and so um, do note that do note that um, React Native um, does not includes view controllers so it's like a MVC model from Apple Coco framework that doesn't directly map into the React Native you need to write JavaScript which is React Native that interact with a view hierarchy and it doesn't and, and it's it doesn't like transform your JavaScript into native code straight away so um, so to so yeah, React Native is a cross platform and it so you can actually um build it in the Samsung TV, Windows Phone, Android phone or even a web page in React Native. So I I haven't really have a time I mean I'm actually going through some uh React I'm actually trying to learn React Native right now to know to try to play around the ideas of um doing some beta project by using React Native but, uh, I, I think I will show it up on GitHub later. So um, next topic, I hope I'm not. I hope I'm not too fast. Uh, next topic is actually at transport security. So uh, the presenter is actually a Japanese called. I mean, the hand is called Ni Niwatako. So um, in in uh, Try Swift Tokyo, a uh, presenter can choose to present in um, Japanese or English. So when let's say if the presenter uh, present <coughs> presented their presentation in Japanese, we will have a a live a live translation. So uh, a live translation. So you have to like listen to it, and uh, it's not necessarily hundred um, percent accurate, but it's actually good enough for us to un to understand what they mean. So uh, app transfer security is actually. Uh, Apple implemented uh, and forced it to improve the privacy and data integrity to ensure that your app network uh, connection is following industrial industry standard protocols. So um, it will it will protect the user that to protect the user to trust your app that does not accidentally leak um, information unwanted information to malicious party. So. Um, so yeah, this is one of the topic that when I talk to uh, different developers, that see like what kind of topic that you um, that you find interesting throughout the uh, first day or second day. This is one of the topic that um, 
most of the people are actually quite interested. So that's why. And um, so uh, last year, uh, by right, Apple uh, enforced that we should actually, when we submit all the app to the App Store, we should have enforced the ATS, um, the app transport security. If not, they will actually um, reject it. But last year, December 21st, they actually like say they're going to um, delay it until when they until the the next announce so um yeah but it's actually a it's actually good to implement it as early as possible and then iOS 10 this is the three uh three variables that um that Apple provide in iOS uh newly introduced it in iOS 10 so i will be kind of um this is like the proper explanation from the Apple website so it's actually um it's actually ensured that if it if you set it to yes it's ensured that your media will actually um has been uh if you set it to yes means you actually uh do you actually um doesn't really follow the the ATS standard so it's actually you say oh it's actually safe to use it but even though it's, it doesn't really follow the um, ATS standard so um, this is for media and this is quite similar but this is for web content which is like our web view and it's usually we use it for our embedded browser so you will actually uh, encounter this problem let's say you are actually your web view actually connected to um, some HTTP website so you will end up having a failed connection or some error connection so yeah so the next one and that's a lot local net working is actually um a lot it's actually you more usually use it in for the intranet so um so do note that if you set all the i mean if you set the key to yes you will need to justify to app stores that um why do you need to set it to yes why are you not following the uh proper standard app transport security so um i showed a graph this is one of the slide from the presentation and so normally for HTTP uh, web web view uh, and this is um, WK web view and you um, and UI web view and NS session so normally on HTTP it can it still can go through right now for but for ATS unsafe HTTPS it won't uh, it will actually block uh, the user from connecting to it so for safe HTTPS of course it will be it's, it's okay to go through and uh, but unfortunately in 10.2 uh, there's kind of like a bug that um, even though uh, by right for unsafe HTTPS they shouldn't uh, so they are not they can't really connect it to the they, they are not allowed to connect it so it's considered a bug in 10.2 in for the for the web content and say let's say uh, for different combination of ATS in iOS 9 and 10 will kind of behave differently and from what I check get it out from online there's a source that he uh, tried to compile it make, make a, a clearer statement like if let's say you are in iOS 9 and you are as in iOS 9 and iOS 10 if you are setting like one of the flag to yes or no what kind of uh, in web view will it, will it be allowed or it or in the URL ses session whether in iOS nine is it is it allowed in ten or nine? So this is like a guide for if one of you want. I mean, if the app actually uh, need to um, connect to iOS nine and ten. All right. Um, server so side Swift, and uh, it's actually uh one of the topic. Uh, that's. Oh, there are actually quite a few presenter presents on this, but I choose uh, uh Yuzuki Ito, and he uh he presented his presentation actually um tried to like persuade like why Swift, but because usually for server server we use um Python Ruby and Swift is not really a a common language that come into mind when you want to develop for server. So, um, but why Swift? Because Swift is considered a safe language. So you you has types, 
protocol associated that it will actually help you to code safely. Uh, so and you have an X code that it actually help you to uh, have you can have the breakpoints for you to debug. So and in his project, he showed the backend service with Swift, which is actually um, by using Swift you can um, claw, crawl the website. So uh, crawl the website content by using Swift. And another project, another his personal project, he's actually used Swift that works with um, Raspberry Pi. That to um, it's actually a program air pressure sensor that runs every hour. And it will use a HTTPS post um, to publish the result to Slack by using Slack API. So, which is one of the I I find quite and uh, you can one of the use case that you can play around. Uh, so after that, I actually um see like what kind of what kind of um server Swift framework that um that has in the market, and I find this tree is um. Perfect is considered the most popular one, considering their, um, what's that? Uh, the stars, is it? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, perfect and Kitura is actually from IBM, and Vapor. I mean, all is actually open source, but um, uh, Kitura. Uh, the, there's a uh, IBM provide um, I, uh, IBM actively support Kitura for Swift. So they even gave a presentation in two zero one six on the topic of going server side with uh, Swift open source. And um, so which they are using um, the IBM inquiry a start a uh, company called Strong Loop, so which is they are actually the maintainer of Express JS, which explain why the syntax in um Kitura is somewhat similar to Express JS. Which is uh if you if you, if you doesn't know Express JS is uh one of the one of the routing language in so for server. So uh they have free trial for thirty days for Kitura. and um so I decided to try out the Wample. It's just like a normal setup thing. It's not really hard to set up, which is quite pleasant if. It's not really intimidating, and the documentation so far is quite clear. Uh, so the last time I checked, is actually uh, they have nine k nine thousand stars, well documented, and syntax also quite similar to Express JS. So um, so in here, uh, the every Swift Swift project actually use the pack Swift package manager. So um, so they will have a um, See if you they will have a package JSON main Swift file. So um so yeah it's actually it's actually quite it, it's simple to set up and it I find quite a lot of tutorials online to for me to um get get my hands on um uh, server Swift on Vapor. So yeah this is also one of the my side projects on on server side Swift so I got quite a lot of pending stuff. So uh perfect is yeah perfect is the most so it got eleven thousand stars and it aims to be the rails rails for Swift. So <laughs> so they are trying to make a complete framework that allow you to do anything that you want to do in Swift. Yeah vision I guess. So <laughs> uh so usually there is I find it's quite easy for you to deploy your web to Heroku. So you can like take your code, initialize it to git repo and just push it to Heroku and it will actually detect what kind, what type of application that you have. They will compile it and uh so if if uh so if let's say Heroku cannot automatically detect Swift, you can set a custom build pack that um that help you to detect I mean, like detect, build, and run the project. <clears throat> so, porting library to Swift, he actually like kind of say it's quite easy to port library to Swift. So you just need to find a C based library, wrap it with Swift, wrap it into more Swifty way, 
and like, like let's say lip curl, lip XML, my SQL connector kind of thing. So you can try your hands on on like batch programs, API server, in house in house deployment tools, command line, just script script it with um Swift. So another really simple kind of thing that I tried my hands on. So um like hello similar quite easy like hello world. So it's just like it's nothing difficult. It's doesn't doesn't look really daunting. It looks very scary to me. Like so I that's why it's actually um encouraged me to dig more to do um explore more in server side Swift. So yeah. I think I repeat my thoughts. <laughs> so, yeah, it's quite. I will actually um continue my site <laughs> project in Server Swift. And testing, uh, one of the testing presentation that I like in uh is actually making mock objects more useful from uh John, from John. He actually he's working for American Express, so um, he got like a few mock recommendation for testing. So usually we when we um create a uh, unit test when we carry create unit test we need to test whether this um function has been run or not we actually use boolean but uh he say it's not really recommended to use boolean what if it actually run twice or uh th three times so it will actually like let's say it might be actually set it to from true to false and back it to true so you end up you thought you actually run it, so it's best to use integer in t instead of boolean. And he um he introduced he actually provide a code. I in my in my in my in my slides later. I will provide a a code project from him that he actually used the file line to assert in the helper class and. He, I mean, he recommends to use message for all the assert tests, which is quite obvious because you might end up doesn't know what the, the unit test is about, maybe a few months later. Uh, and he say to make your unit test less fragile, you should try to use, you should use predicates instead of equi equality. So it's like, um, so predicate, let's say, I will, I would show an example later. So in in this presentation is actually uh using a GitHub, I mean a library called Hamcrus Matches, and um yeah so this is the example for the file line. So why 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 we need to use file line is because um let's say if we actually do a mock uh mock this is the test. This is this is a you um testing that um whether the wait waiter order the right thing and the cook actually cook the right thing. So uh we try to make a false unit test. I mean try to um fail the unit test by saying by right they should cook um they they shouldn't cook three three bowls of um three bowls of, three bowls of ramen. So when it failed, it the error went back to the helper class, which is. Let's say if you have a lot of unit tests that actually um that actually came up from um actually use this um helper class, you might I mean the all the error will actually end up pointing to the helper class and you doesn't know which unit uh, you can't know it right away that which test cases fail. So that's why by using file file line it will direct it back to the uh failed test case. So you will know which test cases fail instead of the helper class, and yeah. So for the pre predicate, Hamcrest matches. Uh, it actually it has a lot of um other language. This it can it it can be available in Java, Python, Ruby, obviously, and um, I think there's recent recent one is the Swift. So um. So yeah, this is the um, GitHub, yeah. and you can see the by using predicate uh, by rec he recommend to use the predicate is by the, let's say the, um, let's say the both it doesn't need to be two you can if it's greater than two <coughs> equal or equal greater than or equal to two is considered past then you can straight away um 
pass the test. It doesn't need to be equal straight away. If not, it's actually quite fragile. And let's say uh, contains in any orders have prefix of tama before this is actually tama go, and yeah, have suffix prefix contain any orders or anything for soups will pass it. So yeah, predicate. So um, and after this, I actually went on uh, looking for some see if there's more. Um, testing framework or testing library. I found out like Nimble is having predicates and matches for this as well. So um, so I and actually more developers that I know use Nimble. So yeah. And this is kind of like um improve user engagement. It's actually I choose this uh, because I find some some designers like doesn't know the full potential of um hours so let's say they don't really use much core spotlights or user activities web markup 3d touch so i mean if if you want to um tell i mean if we tell them that ios actually provide core spotlights or this kind of um uh it actually improves user engagement in the app let's say it helps the user to uh to find the items more and um, quickly find the items quickly and let's say for core spotlights actually um it dates the app search searchable on the spotlights and for user activities it actually store the app states and it restore and to restore it uh, at a later time. Web markup is quite web markup is considered one of the common um common in app feature and 3D touch um to for building an app for quick question in 3D Touch, not only the outside, out, um, at the outside, but also, also you can use it inside the app that you can straight away navigate to um, the detail page. So um, this is like one of the things that you can suggest it to your fellow designer in your company. Yep. And app formatting is quite simple. So right now, uh, we our company is trying to move away from storyboards if we can. So uh, we are trying to code everything, we try to code things in um, in programmatically. And so to pr to code things in, uh, to be more organized, we kind of like try to do it in the styling. So it's like we have, a, let's say we have a primary button, negative button. So you just set what kind of um, the style for primary button should be um, in ABC medium form and the title should be in white dark so you actually have a custom one so what if in the future that your designer decided like oh all the buttons should change colors change pad change padding or change width or something you can you can go back to the one you can go back to one file and change it and it doesn't need to go back to all the storyboards to change it it will be really really painful so this is how we use it for, I mean, use it when we call it. So you can, it's actually quite straightforward that you just apply, you just um, have your UI button and apply the primary style to the button. So not that difficult for this. It's like one of the ragged to be more swifty way. File organization. Um, so sometimes um, we used to uh, organize the file into like um, there's a view model, there's a view model and there's a view controller. So you sometimes the view model is inside the view controller. So and sometimes when you have a screen, you have a feature that actually share among all the screen. So it doesn't know where to put the file actually. So in one of the presenter actually suggested to categorize it in application components and UI. So application would be like the base stuff like all the app delegate stuff in launch screen storyboards so the components will be like yeah components will be like authentication comments which is um like um things that will be used across the ui so ui will be uh, all the view controllers and protocol for this for the screen and okay so topics that i which I can cover it today, but I can't. So <laughs> you can look it up from the link that uh, later I will be sharing up for 
for all the slides, it has all the, the slide is quite detailed. So uh, when you read the slide, you will understand it. And that's actually at the Realm, uh, Realm website, they actually um, start releasing a lot of uh, the records for that day. So um, you can actually take a look at it as well. All right, takeaways. Takeaways from Try Swift Tokyo, not only about technical stuff for three days, which is quite tiring for me. <laughs> so uh, it's actually quite uh, enjoyable experience. So if you let's, I'm, I would really like to encourage if you got the chance, you should go to more conference overseas. You just talk to different people, and they actually coming. I met with a random guy. Um, during the networking session, and he actually he he was one of the presenter, uh, on the first day, and he says he's working for a genetic company thing, ge genetic company. So um so yeah, it's actually quite fun to know about other company processes, how they do their testing, how they carry carry out their scrum, their agile, and. Their side project like all this object detection, accessibility, or like inclusive design. It's actually just quite fun. It's just different from your normal days of commercial mobile project. So, yeah. So um, after this Swift Tokyo, when you see like different people present, that's why it actually encouraged me to come back and try to present. Hopefully, it's not really a bad presentation. So um yeah. So um so in I, I joined the hackathon halfway. So <laughs> so um I, I believe uh, next year they will still have their hackathon and workshop. Um like Eric from the Swift on Android he actually provide a workshop. So you can if you don't want to join hackathon you can join workshops. And yeah, it's actually have a chance to introduce Tiger Spike to other developers. So <laughs> And uh, yeah, this is the slides link, and you can download it. I zip it up and zip it all thing, all the things together. So that's it. Thank you. Anyone has any questions or anything?